Yo, yo, what's up, y'all? It's Cohen back here again today with another video. If you're watching this on the day that it's coming out, which if you're not, then why are you not subscribed with notifications on? But if you are, the NBA season is back today. Uh, these are my official predictions for the 2021-2022 NBA season. As is tradition, I'm getting them out the day of the season starting, so I've got all the information that I could possibly have up to this point, but I do want to say feel free to come back to this video in like a year when the season is pretty much wrapped and I was wrong about pretty much everything. That's the way that predictions videos typically go. This season more than ever has been difficult to predict. When I was going through making these predictions, I've gone back and forth on things so many times. And even now, I'm not certain as I'm making this video about some of my predictions. I feel like so many teams are so close in these conferences. There's so many injuries. There's just weird situations like Kyrie not maybe not playing for the net. So how does that affect them? Ben Simmons, are the Sixers going to trade him? How long will that hold out last? And then whatever team he gets traded to, how does that impact them? There's just so many things up in the air that are hard to predict. And so I did my best. I can't promise these are going to be amazing. I like to think I know basketball pretty well, but making predictions is notoriously really difficult. You throw in the fact that there's always injuries that sometimes teams and chemistry just don't work out together. The NBA is kind of a soap opera. So uh, dramas pop up sometimes there's COVID. There is a million different things that could shift these predictions. But right now, right here, this is what I've got. And we're going to go through it kind of chronologically, starting with my season predictions, where I think each team will end up in the NBA regular season standings, one through 15 for each conference. Then we're going to move on to the major awards, MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, and so on. Then I'll talk about all NBA, all rookie and all defensive teams. And finally, I will talk about my playoff predictions, where specifically I will say which two teams I have making the conference finals in each conference, which team will win each of those, and then which team will win the NBA finals and who will win finals MVP. Those are all the predictions I'm going to make in this video. If you want something else, if you want me to predict something else, like maybe some bold predictions for the season, I could drop that tomorrow, maybe. So let me know in the comment section below. But for right now, this is what I've got, and I hope you enjoy my predictions. It might be a longer video, so if it is, hope you enjoy. All right, so like I said, we're going to be starting off with the NBA standings prediction. So I'm going to go through each conference, starting with the East and then moving to the West and tell you which teams I'm going to have in this top row. They're going to be the one through three seeds, then the four through six, seven to 10. So that's the play in range, 11 through 13, and then the bottom two at 14 and 15. Starting with the Eastern Conference in the one seat, I have the Milwaukee Bucks. I think that they're going to kind of replicate their success from the playoffs this past year. They kept most of the same roster. We know what they are, and they don't have a, some of the dramas that a few of the other top teams that I'll get to in a second kind of have. I think they're consistent. I think they have one of the best players in the world, at worst, like a top two player in the world in Giannis Antetokounmpo, who's going to make a push for an MVP uh, year this season. He could even make a push for defensive player of the year again. He's just an all around dominant player that's now showing signs of maybe having more of a jumper this upcoming season. He's unstoppable. I really don't see any way that the Bucks are any worse than like a top three seed. And I think that they're going to kind of show why they're defending champions and they're going to go for that one seed. At the two spot, I have the Philadelphia 76ers. I think as a team, uh, they do have the Ben Simmons situation, but I'm kind of thinking that that'll be resolved sooner than later, especially with the stuff that we're hearing today where Doc Rivers threw him out of practice. He's being suspended from games. I don't think this can go on for much longer. And I think with Joel Embiid on your roster, as well as a lot of talented pieces like Matisse Thibel, who's an all defensive guy, Seth Curry, Tobias Harris, Tyrese Maxey, Shake Milton. I think they're Furkan Korkmaz even. They're just a talented roster. I think Andre Drummond is going to be a solid backup center. And overall, they will end up as the second seed in the East. At the three spot, I have the Brooklyn Nets. Once again, a drama for them with Kyrie Irving, but I do think there is a chance he could play at some point during the season. And even if he doesn't, I think James Harden and Kevin Durant is plenty to get you to the three seed. I don't think they care that much about seeding, so I don't think they'll push super hard for one of the top two seeds, maybe not even hard enough for the three seed. But I do think overall the talent that they have there, throwing some of their good role players like Blake Griffin, Patty Mills, Joe Harris, uh, Bruce Brown, their Cam Thomas looked like a steal in the draft. They're going to be good enough to get a top three seed, even if Kyrie doesn't play. At the four spot, I have the Miami Heat. Uh, this is a team that I really think could be kind of like a Utah Jazz team last year where they all of a sudden make a push and go for like a one seed. I think all four of these teams are good enough to make that kind of push. But I do have them here just because it's a brand new roster. There might be some time to gel. And in addition, uh, this team has had some injury concerns in the past, throwing the fact that their bench isn't the strongest. They're waiting on Victor Oladipo to get back. And if he gets back sooner than later, they could be higher than this. But for right now, I'm going to put them at four. 
At five, I'm going to have the Atlanta Hawks. This is another team I could really see making a big jump and pushing for maybe even like a one or a two seed if everything goes their way. The reason I have them down here is just because I feel like these teams are better roster wise, but as a team cohesively, as a unit that has kind of stayed together, I could see the Atlanta Hawks making a jump all the way up, like I said, maybe even to like a one or a two seed. But for right now, I do have them at five. At the sixth spot, I have the Boston Celtics, another really talented team that I think could make a jump. The East is just so close. I think like all of this, especially like three, four, five, six, maybe even up to two are going to be very, very, very close to where teams kind of go back and forth between games every single day. Teams switch back and forth. It's going to be a really close conference. And we'll see that even more as we go to like the seven, eight, and especially in the playing section. But for right now with the Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, great, great players, enough to get them to the sixth seed at least. And you have a coach in Ime Udoka, who I think is going to be a good coach, but it makes might take some time. They do have a lot of young players on the roster like Neesmith and Pritchard, who are going to have to play bigger roles, but they also added guys like Richardson and Schroeder, who I think are going to help them, uh, considering they are also probably not going to be as beat up as they were last season. They were ridiculously injured last year. I think they kind of found a formula that works, and I think that will be enough to get them at least here to the sixth seed. At seven, I have the Chicago Bulls. I think they could be much higher than this. I think they have one of the most talented starting lineups in the NBA, but for right now, I'm going to leave them here just because it's all brand new. Lonzo's brand new coming in. Uh, you have DeMar DeRozan, who's brand new coming in. And with those guys, how is Zach Levine going to adapt to not having the ball as much? How will Nikola Vucevic adapt? It's just going to be a matter of kind of gelling as a unit. Once they do, I think they're going to be really, really hard to stop. But for right now, I think it's going to take some time and I have them at the seven seed at the eight spot. I do have the New York Knicks. They were great defensively. And I think their offense did get a little bit better. I still don't love that right now. Probably their best shot maker is Kemba Walker. Um, you still have Julius Randle, who was a great player, an all NBA player this past season. It's just a matter of can they quite replicate how great their defense was. A lot of the East got a lot better and I'm just not quite sure the Knicks kept up. At the eight spot or nine spot, excuse me, I have the uh, Indiana Pacers. I think that they're super talented once again. They just can't seem to stay healthy. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon, DeMontis Sabonis, Miles Turner, TJ Warren, Karis LeVert. If they can stay healthy, they're a great roster. Throw in the fact that they have Rick Carlisle now as their head coach. And I think this is a team that could push for the playoffs and even solidify themselves higher up. But I just don't trust them to be super healthy. So I'm going to have them here at nine. At 10, I've gone back and forth between this. Um, I'm going to go with the Toronto Raptors. I think with Pascal Siakam, I think OG Ananobi is going to have a breakout year, Fred Van Vliet, and just a great coach in Nick Nurse. Throwing the fact that they're not going to be playing in Tampa Bay this season, they're going to be actually playing in Toronto. I think that they're going to end up in the play-in tournament. At the 11 spot, I have the Hornets. It kills me to not put the Hornets up here. I think they're really, really good. I like the Hornets a lot. I just don't know if they're quite there yet. They're very young, and I think with the Toronto Raptors, they have more established guys. They've been there, and overall just have a better coach in Nick Nurse, and I think that might cost the Hornets a playing spot. They're one of my favorite teams to watch in the entire NBA, and it would suck if they didn't make it at least to the play-in, but I think they might come up a little bit short. Same with the Washington Wizards. I think all like this play-in, especially like eight, starting at eight with the Knicks, all the way down to the Wizards, it's going to be really tight in that section. The Wizards did lose star power in Russell Westbrook, but added a lot of depth that I think is going to keep them in the race for this play-in spot. Then at 13, you have the Cleveland Cavaliers. They're talented. They're just young. And that's kind of the same thing with the Detroit Pistons. And the Orlando Magic, I think, are just going to be the worst team in the NBA. They're super young, and they just don't have really a star at all. So I think the Magic will be the worst team in the East and overall the worst team in the NBA. Cool. So those are my Eastern Conference standings. Like I said, there are a million things that could have changed, but right now this is just what I'm feeling. Over in the West, we have the Los Angeles Lakers at the one seed for me. Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, LeBron James. I think now that they've had a full offseason to kind of rest after going out early in the playoffs, I think they're going to be better rested. I think they're going to kind of be looking for vengeance. I think they feel wronged, like we got screwed by this offseason, like a bunch of different things. And I think they're going to come for vengeance, come for it hard, and they're going to get win the West, at least in terms of regular season standings. At two, I have the Phoenix Suns. I think people are underrating them. Too many people think that what they did was a fluke. Yes, other teams were injured, but the Suns didn't get there by accident. They pushed the defending champions to six games. And if they had won, would people have still said it was a fluke? Who knows? But the Phoenix Suns are an incredible team. Chris Paul, Devin Booker. The DeAndre Ayton situation is a little 
hesitant to me because he has missed media availability um he's been kind of hinting that he really wanted to get paid and he didn't maybe that creates some friction and like a team like the utah jazz who i have at the three spot end up taking the two spot but for right now i'm gonna leave the suns there the jazz last year's western conference uh, regular season leaders I'm going to go with them to make the three spot. I just think that these two teams are really good. I think all three of these teams, I feel pretty good about them being the top three teams. This is just the order I settled on. At four, the Golden State Warriors, they're going to be back this season. I think when Clay returns, you've got Wiggins, you've got Draymond, you've got Jordan Poole, who I think could have a breakout season. I like bringing in Otto Porter as a 3 and D wing. I like Jonathan Kuminga and Moses Moody as rookies that can kind of play some minutes, especially Moses Moody as a bucket getter. I think they're going to be a good, great team. I think that they make some big strides from last season. If Steph stays healthy like he did last season, last season when Steph was healthy, they played on about like a 48 win pace. It was just a question of if Steph was able to be on the court all the time, whether it was in terms of health or the fact that he just needed to sit sometimes. I think they addressed some of their issues and I like them here at the four spot. At the five spot, I have the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, Luka Doncic, I think is going to have an incredible season and that'll be enough to get them here. Even if Chris Stops doesn't quite play like the player that he once did. The Denver Nuggets, not there. I have them there at the six spot. Jokic is enough to maybe even get them a top three seed, to be honest. This is just where I settled on them without Jamal Murray. They don't have great guard depth whatsoever. That's going to hurt them in the long run. I have the Portland Trailblazers at seven at the edge of the play-in tournament. I like some of their acquisitions. I like bringing in Larry Nance, for example. I like Zeller. I think those are two pieces that could work well, maybe even a Tony Snell. But I don't think they did enough to really push themselves up in the conference, especially when like Nurkic deals with some injuries most seasons. Uh, CJ McCollum has injury issues every now and again, like he did last season. I just don't think it's enough to really push them forward. Last year, I really fell for it and I put them at the three seed and I refused to get burned again. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. At the eight spot, I have the Los Angeles Clippers. Paul George, I think, puts up incredible numbers and leads them to a play in berth, even without Kawhi Leonard. At the nine spot, I have the New Orleans Pelicans. I think they finally make a play in push behind Zion and Ingram. Devonta Graham is a downgrade from Lonzo Ball, but he might fit better in terms of just the fact that I hope they've learned their lesson and now they use their point guard as more of a point guard rather than making their point guard in Lonzo Ball, who is a great playmaker, into more of a spot up shooter, which credit to Lonzo, he did well but I just don't think it really fit their scheme very well. We'll see how things work out, but especially the addition of Jonas Valanciunas, I think makes them super dangerous inside. You would bring in the addition of like a Trey Murphy in the draft, who is a great shooter. I think Nikhil Alexander Walker could have a good season. And I think this Pelicans team makes a jump. At 10, the final playing spot, I have the Minnesota Timberwolves. I think they make a push as well. I like their young team. I like Anthony Edwards as a scorer. Carl Anthony Towns, I think, is in for kind of a revenge season, maybe. I think you could see uh, D'Angelo Russell fitting in well. If all three guys can stay on the court, including role players like Patrick Beverly, Malik Beasley, McDaniels, Vanderbilt, this team's going to be fun, and they're going to be pretty good. I expect them to make this push. At 11, I have the Memphis Grizzlies. I think losing Jonas Valanciunas hurts a lot more than a lot of people realize. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr.'s breakout could push them into a playing spot, but for right now, I've got them at 11. At 12, I have the, um, I have the Sacramento Kings. It's where they've been for like the past decade. Nothing has changed. At 13, I have the Oklahoma City Thunder. I think we're going to be better than some people realize. I say we because that's my favorite team. If you couldn't tell from the Thunder Bander behind me, I think the Thunder are going to be a little bit better. Shea Gilgis Alexander is a great player. Uh, Lou Gwynn Stort, I think, could make an all defensive push possibly this season. Uh, Josh Giddy's going to have a great rookie season. And I think overall, there's enough young talent on the roster to make a push for this 13 spot. But I really expect the bottom of the West to be pretty bad. At 14, I have the Houston Rockets, super young, similar to the Pistons, just not a lot of super established talent yet. And finally, the San Antonio Spurs at 15, they're going to be bad. I think they're going to have fun young players in DeJounte Murray, Keldon Johnson, Lonnie Walker, etc. But they just don't have enough talent to really compete in this really tough Western Conference. So these are my seedings. Um, like I said, a lot of things could change. If you ask me to do this in like an hour, I might shift some things around, but this is where I've settled on and it's what I'm going to stick with. So let me know what you think about this. And next we're going to move on to NBA awards.
For award predictions, I'm going to go ahead and start off with the major awards, and then we're going to move into the all NBA teams, whether that's the all NBA teams themselves, all defensive and all rookie teams. And then, like I said, moving on eventually to my playoff predictions, but starting off with the major awards. Uh, the first award I want to go over is the defensive player of the year award. There are a lot of people in consideration for this. As I mentioned, Giannis, I think could make a push. Rudy Gobert kind of has had a stranglehold on it for most of this past like three, four year period. But the guy that I'm going to go with is Bam Adebayo. I think Bam Adebayo is going to have a great season, not just defensively, but offensively with the addition of Kyle Lowry. I think the Heat unit is good enough to be the best defensive unit in the entire NBA. And I think having Bam Adebayo as the anchor of that will be enough to get him the award. He's someone that I think is going to win this award at some point. And I think this is finally the season where he ends up winning it. He's just going to be the anchor of what I think might be the best defense in the NBA. Uh, he can block shots. He can guard on the perimeter. He can do pretty much anything. He's one of the most versatile defenders at the center position we've seen in a little while. And I think he's going to really impress a lot of people and win the Defensive Player of the Year award this season. Next, the Sixth Man of the Year award, I think it's going to be a repeat, and I'm going to go with Jordan Clarkson. The Jazz didn't really change much about the construction of their roster. Clarkson's still going to come in. He's still going to get a lot of buckets, and I think he is a guy that ends up going out and getting that award. And honorable mention, I do want to give to Tyler Hero, another guy on the Heat that I think could maybe win the award. I think he's a player that is, like I mentioned, Heat don't have a great bench unit. He's going to have a lot of pressure on him to perform and be the main facilitator when the bench comes in. And I think he's going to do a pretty good job of that. He's developing, he's getting better. And while a lot of people don't think he's very good for some reason because he's become a mean player, he's still a solid player. And I think he would do enough to maybe be one of the leading scorers off the bench. I just don't quite see it happening this year. Maybe at some point during his career, that's a possibility. Another guy, Dennis Schroeder, he almost won the award a couple seasons ago, and for the Celtics, I think he's going to come off the bench, and he could maybe replicate some of the success he saw a season ago, or a couple seasons ago. Another person is Montrose Harrell, an award winner from a couple seasons ago, that I think is going to once again come off the bench uh, after starting for a little bit for the Lakers this past season. He's going to come off the bench for the Washington Wizards, and with less scores than the Lakers had, I think he could have another great season. So those are some of my picks. Uh, also Jordan Poole, but I think D Jordan Poole is going to start off starting for a lot of the year, so I don't think he'll come off the bench for enough games to really make a case for the Sixth Man of the Year award, but those are some of the people I considered when picking this. For most improved player, speaking of Jordan Poole, he's my pick. I think Jordan Poole is going to average a little under 20 points per game until Klay Thompson comes back. He's going to be a starter. Even when Klay comes back, I think they might try and find a way for him to start. He was amazing at the end of last season, and I think he's really going to carry that over, and he's going to be a big reason why the Warriors make that jump up until that like that 4-5 seed spot. He's going to be a big piece for this team going forward. This is his chance to contribute, and I think he takes advantage of that. I like Jordan Poole a lot for this award. There are a couple other players I could think about. A lot of guys on the Thunder, I think Shea could make a push if he really pushed his scoring up to maybe like 26, 27 points per game, which I think he can do. Not a lot of y'all probably do, but I think he can. Uh, OG Ananobi is a player I like a lot, but he kind of broke out a lot more towards the end of the season, and I don't think his numbers are going to be up enough for him to quite win the award. Amongst some other guys, um, there are some other names you could throw out there as well. Another Thunder guy is like a Darius Baisley maybe. But I am going to go with Jordan Poole. Uh, for coach of the year, I went with Eric Spolstra. I think the Heat have a good season. Even if they are the four seed, I think they're going to be really tough to beat on any given night. And I think he will be in consideration. I think they've kind of been looking at him to give him that award for a few seasons because after the Heat's bubble run, they've realized how good of a coach he is. I think he is going to get this unit to kind of get along together and become more cohesive a lot quicker than many coaches could. And I think he does end up getting recognized for that. He's going to have one of the best defenses in the NBA, and I think he gets the recognition with a Coach of the Year award. His first one, which is kind of crazy to me, but he is deserving of one at some point, and I think this year he gets it. Next, Executive of the Year, I think it's going to be Rob Palenka of the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, he brought in Russell Westbrook, and I think if they get the one seed, that award is basically a given for him. I'm not going to go too much into that. You could also take a look at Pat Riley for the Heat, making a lot of the moves that he did, and even Arturus Karnishovas for the Chicago Bulls. If the Bulls do end up shining more than I thought they would in my standings predictions, maybe they get like a four or a five seed. He should get a lot of consideration for that award. For the um, Rookie of the Year award, I have Cade Cunningham. 
I know Jalen Green is the most popular pick, and it makes sense. He's a great scorer, and he's going to pop a lot more. He has a flashier game than Cade Cunningham, but I think Cade is going to come out and have more of a well-rounded stat line than Jalen Green will. I don't think either of their teams are really going to outshine the other, so it's going to kind of just come down to statistics, and I think ultimately Cade Cunningham will have a more all-around statistical kind of output. I think he's going to have more assists, more rebounds, and he's not going to score a lot less than Jalen Green, so that's what I'm going to go with. I think Josh Giddy also gets in the conversation. He could maybe even be like the third place finisher. Jalen Suggs is someone that can maybe make a push, but there's a lot of guards on that Magic roster. Same with a guy like Scotty Barnes, who... I think he's going to have pretty solid numbers, but he's behind OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, amongst others at the wing position. And so it's going to be kind of difficult for him to get the run needed to really win a Rookie of the Year award. And finally, a guy like Evan Mobley, just playing alongside Jared Allen, he's going to take some of his stats. And so it might be tough for him to really kind of make a push for that award, but he definitely, I think, will get in that conversation. And finally, the last award that I have to go through is the MVP award. I've gone really back and forth on this. I made a video a couple months ago where I gave like my way too early NBA season predictions and I predicted Steph Curry to win the MVP award. I'm going to go with Giannis. I've been really back and forth between these two guys, but I think Giannis is going to lead the Bucks to the top overall seed. They're going to have a great defense, great offense. And I think while I don't expect him to become a great shooter, I think some of the progress that we've seen in his jump shot will translate and he's going to be a solid shooter this season. And that's terrifying for the rest of the league. And I think ultimately Giannis ends up winning his third MVP award. I think the voter fatigue has kind of worn off after last season where he didn't win it. I think now they're ready to maybe give him this award again. And coming off of a finals MVP, the spotlight's going to be on him. So if he leads the Bucks to once again, a one seed, the best team in the conference, if not the best team in the NBA, he is going to win this award. And I think he will end up doing that. Other guys include Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, especially if he leads his team to a top record without Jamal Murray, I think should be in consideration. Maybe we'll see like a LeBron James or Anthony Davis, maybe even a Kevin Durant now that Kyrie's not playing. But the problem with the Lakers and Nets players is that they have got so much talent on their rosters that I don't think MVP voters are really going to look at them as much as some of these other guys. Ultimately, I think the award ends up going to Giannis and he caps off his last season where he had finals MVP to going in and winning another MVP and trying to make another run to the NBA finals. So those are my award predictions. Now we're going to move on to moving on to our all NBA teams at the all NBA first team first guard spot. We have Luka Doncic. I think Luka is going to have an MVP caliber season. I'm just not quite sure if the team success is going to quite up quite be as high as it needs to be for him to win the award, but I do think he puts up a monster statistical season and ends up getting an all NBA first team nod. Alongside him at the second guard position, I have Steph Curry, the guy that I've been going back and forth with between Giannis about who's going to get the MVP award, uh, which as I picked him for my MVP award, Giannis will be here at the three spot. Then I'm going to pick Kevin Durant, another guy who I think could greatly compete for this MVP award, but because of having James Harden on his roster, won't quite get as much consideration as some of these other guys. And finally, I did pick Joel Embiid to make the center spot. I think when healthy, he's going to get the nod. I think he might've gotten the nod if he had been healthy all season last year, but for right now, I'm going to put him here at the five spot. So we have Luca, Curry, Giannis, Kevin Durant, and Joel Embiid. I don't think many people are going to disagree with this list. Maybe you have like LeBron James in here. Maybe you put like James Harden at one of these spots, or you put Nicole Jokic at the center spot. But overall, I think this is, I don't think this is anything too crazy. For my second team, at the first guard spot, I have Damian Lillard. Once again, nothing wild. It's Dame. Uh, at the Second guard spot, I do have James Harden. He missed a lot of time this last season, but when he did play, he was he looked like an MVP candidate. And for a while, I thought he should have gotten consideration. He kept the Nets afloat when Kyrie and Kevin Durant were both gone, including a big win over the Phoenix Suns. I think Kevin Durant could miss some time for rest. And even if he doesn't, having to play without Kyrie Irving, he's going to have to carry a much bigger load scoring and um, playmaking wise. I do expect him to make the All-NBA second team. Another guy who I expect to be back in this All-NBA second team range is LeBron James. LeBron out for a lot of last season with that ankle injury. I think he's going to be back and alongside Russell Westbrook and Anthony Davis. He's going to have a great season where the Lakers get the one seed. Then at another four position, I'm picking Paul George. This is probably the not most controversial, but a lot of people might not get this pick. And the big reason is without Kawhi Leonard, I think Paul George is going to put up ridiculous numbers. I think he's going to put up numbers similar to his MVPG days back in Oklahoma City a few seasons ago, where he looks like an MVP and defensive player of the year candidate. 
I don't think his team is going to be good enough for him to make the MVP push, but I do think he will be good enough to make the All-NBA second team. And if Jokic isn't on All-NBA first team, he's got to be on All-NBA second team. So this is where I have him. I don't think, once again, this is anything too crazy. For third team, I think I'm going to put Trey Young here. Trey Young coming off a great playoff run where he led the Hawks to a Eastern Conference Finals berth that a lot of people didn't expect them to get. He's going to have a great year once again. He's kind of mastered the pick and roll at a very young age, and he's going to make the most of this season, getting this guard spot nod. Alongside him, I have Devin Booker, the other guard, um, which now we kind of get to snub territory. Who won't make it? Devin Booker, I think, is going to be the best player on that Phoenix Suns team that does get the two seed. And I think some of the snubs, I guess you can go now are, um, you could talk about a Bradley Beal, a Chris Paul, a Shea Gilgis Alexander, Russell Westbrook. I just don't think that these players are going to have the success that Devin Booker is going to have. And with Chris Paul, I think Devin Booker is just going to get the nod here. At the three spot, I have Jason Tatum. I think Tatum is going to have an incredible season as well. Once again, I keep saying it, he feels like a guy that's going to win MVP at some point. And I think this, he's going to get an all NBA nod here. At the four spot, I have Anthony Davis. Um, it, I hope he starts at center at some point, but tonight they're starting him at power forward and they're starting DeAndre Jordan. So we'll see if he ever actually plays center. So for right now, putting him here at the power forward position. And finally at center, I went back and forth between Bam and Carl Anthony Towns. I'm going to go with Bam just because I think he gets the nod with the Heat being a top four seed, but I could see Carl Anthony Towns getting this nod as well. And of course, I picked Bam to be my defensive player of the year. So, you know have to put him here on the team. So these are my all NBA teams. Other snubs for these positions include, um, we could talk about like a Jalen Brown doesn't end up making it. Um, Rudy Gobert doesn't end up making it. Zach Levine, of course, Kyrie Irving's not going to play most of the season, or at least we don't think he's going to. Uh, Donovan Mitchell is another guy not on here on Nikola Vucevic, Zion Williamson, Jimmy Butler, John Morant, just some examples. Ben Simmons also not on here. So those are some guys that aren't going to make this list, but ultimately these are the guys that I went with. Once again, this could change like in 10 minutes, but these are the guys that I went with for the all NBA teams this season. Next, we're going to do all defensive teams. Here are my all defensive teams for this upcoming season. Nothing too crazy. I've got Drew, Ben, Giannis, Bam, and Gobert on my first team. And on second team, I have Marcus Smart, Luguin Stort. Yes, I'm biased. I don't care. Matisse Thibel, Anthony Davis, and Joel Embiid. Nothing too crazy. I guess like a guy like Jimmy Butler could be considered a notable snub amongst some other guys. But for right now, this is the team I went with. Nothing too crazy. Uh, kind of uniform, I feel like, other than maybe Luguin Stort, but I don't care. Finally, for my all rookie teams, I really I couldn't find a tier list. I, I couldn't find anything to kind of like visualize it, but I thought I would kind of just say them here. For my all rookie teams on my first team, of course, I have Jalen Green and Kate Cunningham. I think they'll be the two leaders for the rookie of the year conversation. Then I threw on Josh Giddy. I think he's going to have a much better rookie season than a lot of people realize. Going to have great playmaking. He's going to have kind of like a Ben Simmons type stat line where he doesn't score a lot, but he gets a lot of rebounds and assists. Then Evan Mobley, of course, the third overall pick. I think he's going to have a good season. And finally, I had Davion Mitchell at the fifth spot on the all-rookie teams. And then for the second all-rookie team, I had B Bones or Nashawn Highland, however you want to pronounce his name, uh, just because I think that without Jamal Murray, he's going to get a lot of opportunity to compete and try and help produce at that guard position. I also had Jalen Suggs and Scotty Barnes, the fourth and fifth overall picks. Then I had James Buchnight, and finally I had Chris Duarte. He's kind of more of an established player, and so I think he's going to have, even if he doesn't end up as one of the best players from this draft class, I think he's going to have a pretty good rookie season. He's going to establish and contribute immediately, especially on a Pacers team that has a lot of injury concerns. I think he's going to come in and make an impact right away. And finally, here are my NBA playoff predictions. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go through and predict every single series because that would take me a really long time. And this is already going to be like a 30 minute video. Plus, I need to get it out to y'all before the NBA games start. So I'm going to kind of just stick to what I did last year, which is where I predicted the teams that would be in each conference finals and predict the winner of each, predict the NBA finals and give you a finals MVP to end the video. So in the East, I have the Brooklyn Nets and the Milwaukee Bucks meeting in the Eastern Conference Finals. I think they're the two best teams in the East right now, and I think they will end up meeting each other, even if they're not the top two seeds. I think by the end, it will be them. Um, they were probably the best two teams in the East again last season. But of course, they met in the conference semifinals. I think we get that rematch here with much bigger stakes where it's who gets to go to the NBA Finals. The question, of course, comes down to does Kyrie Irving play in this series? And I personally think at some point during the season, somewhere along the line, Kyrie is going to start playing. 
whether that's mandates lift or Kyrie gets vaccinated, I think eventually Kyrie ends up playing. So when I look at this series, if Kyrie is playing, I have to pick the Brooklyn Nets. There is definitely a world where even with Kyrie Irving, the Milwaukee Bucks as the NBA champions beat the Brooklyn Nets. But I think Kyrie does play. And I think ultimately, also without Kyrie Irving, I think the Bucks do win this series. But I'm going to say that Kyrie plays. And I think that the Nets beat the Milwaukee Bucks in seven games behind great performances from their big three. It's just too much firepower for the Bucks to stop. And Giannis's attempt to go back to back finals MVPs alongside the MVP that he had just won falls a bit short in the Eastern Conference Finals just to a super stacked Brooklyn Nets team. And over in the West, I have the Los Angeles Lakers and the Phoenix Suns meeting in the Western Conference Finals. Uh, LeBron James versus Chris Paul, Anthony Davis versus DeAndre Ayton, Russell Westbrook, of course, against like a Devin Booker, Chris Paul. It, there's a lot of star power and fun matchups in this series, but I do have the Lakers winning this one in six games. I think that ultimately the Lakers are the best team in the Western Conference with Russell Westbrook, with LeBron James, with Anthony Davis. They have a lot of talent and I think it's going to fit a lot better than most people think it's going to. Hopefully Anthony Davis at some point commits to playing center because I do think that is their best path to success. But ultimately, I think the Lakers make their way through the West, meet the Suns once again in another matchup of a series we saw last season. But this time, as opposed to being in the first round, it's in the conference finals. And I think the Lakers do take down the Suns. They're just not going to be able to stop Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and Russell Westbrook. It's just too much firepower. And that gives us the finals that most people are going to predict because these are the two best teams in each conference at this point, in my opinion, assuming Kyrie plays Lakers versus Nets. And it's going to be amazing. You've got Russell Westbrook versus Kevin Durant, LeBron James versus Kyrie Irving, Anthony Davis, James Harden, Russell Westbrook and James Harden were teammates. You've got so many different narratives in this matchup that are going to be super fun to watch. Solid role players on both sides. You have like DeAndre Jordan, who just played on the Nets and they let him go. Now he's on the Lakers and he's starting at center for them tonight. There's so much to talk about here. And this is the dream for all NBA media outlets. I can promise you every NBA media outlet is rooting for this matchup to happen because this, the ratings would be ridiculous and it makes sense. So much star power, so much story, so much is on the line for all these players legacies. And I do think it comes down to a seven game series. I think these teams are pretty evenly matched. They're both phenomenal rosters. I'm going to pick the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm biased. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I like LeBron a lot. Russell Westbrook is my favorite player of all time. Of course, you've got the Thunder flag in the background here. I like the Lakers. I want to see the Lakers succeed, and I do think they could overcome the Nets. I don't think Kyrie can stop Russell Westbrook. I think LeBron James is going to be a really tough guard. Anthony Davis, there's really no one on that Nets roster to stop him. I like the way this Lakers roster is built a lot more than other people, and I think ultimately they end up winning the championship, and your finals MVP is Anthony Davis. If they're going to win it all, it's going to come down to him. He's going to have to guard up and defend uh, a lot of times Kevin Durant. He's going to have to really abuse their weaknesses inside, and he is the key to them winning that series. And so if the Lakers do win the series like I think they're going to, he is going to be the finals MVP, and that is my prediction for the NBA season. Let me know what you thought about all my picks. Uh, I know, like I said, most of this, if not all of this, is going to be wrong. That's just the way the NBA goes, but I still have fun making these videos. Let me know what your predictions are in the comment section below, and also just give me your predictions for tonight's games, uh, Bucks versus Nets and Lakers versus Warriors. Let me know down there in the comment section below. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Game recaps are going to be coming once again on most nights. Uh, you're going to definitely see one tonight, as well as NBA content all throughout the season, so don't miss out on that. I appreciate y'all watching. I will see you all later. Real one say it back.